Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to join me in our inaugural discussions from Drink of Hall event. My name is Lincoln Davies, and I have the privilege of serving as the dean here at the Ohio State University Morris College of Law. Uh, my first year has been a unique experience, to say the least. Um, we face many challenges, uh, but I can also say that it's so inspiring to see the community that we have and the way that our faculty, staff, and everyone in Drink of Hall have come together. Uh, to lift our school and to meet the needs of our students. Discussions from Drinko Hall was conceived to showcase the college's faculty and alumni who are thought leaders on today's most important topics. We hope you're going to utilize this series going forward to continue your personal and professional educational journeys. Of course, uh, we call it discussions from Drinko Hall and in this uh, very first event here today, uh, we're not really in Drinko Hall. A, a couple of us are and a couple of us uh, are scattered across uh, the Central Ohio area. Um, a little bit of information about how uh, the flow of our discussion today will go. Um, I have a few questions to ask the panelists to get the conversation started and I will do that. However, we have ample time uh, for audience participation and really encourage you to ask the questions you may have and to utilize this time to learn from our experts. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that you may have um, as they arise and we can take those uh, as we go through the discussion. Today, as I mentioned, is the first discussion in the series and it's uh, entitled Staying in, the front, uh, Staying in Front of the COVID-19 Cure, Legal and Ethical Challenges That Lie Ahead. The idea here is to examine the new state of our healthcare system. Our world has been forever changed by the coronavirus. And although we have been inundated with statistics and data about the curve, potential vaccinations and long-term projections, less focus has been placed on all the social and legal implications that COVID-19 has created. To discuss these concerns today and to help answer your questions, I'm pleased to welcome Ephemi Parasitis, Patty Zutler, and Micah Berman, all members of our faculty. Micah is an Associate Professor of Public Health and Law at The Ohio State University's College of Public Health and the Michael E. Morris College of Law his research explores the intersection between public health and research in the legal doctrine uh, with a focus on tobacco policy. He's the co-author of a public health law textbook from Oxford University Press, The New Public Health Law, A Transdisciplinary Approach to Practice and Advocacy. Uh, welcome, Micah. Themi Parasitis is a nationally recognized expert on health law and bioethics. He holds a joint appointment with the law school and the College of Public Health here at Ohio State and is a faculty affiliate with the College of Medicine Center for Bioethics. He's a co-author of a leading textbook or casebook uh, on the ethics and regulation of research with human subjects, has a book on military medical ethics under contract with uh, also Oxford University Press, and has had his work featured in over 30 publications. Professor Parasitis worked in the New York offices of Jones Day and Dickstein Shapiro uh, and was an assistant attorney general for the state of New York under Elliot Spitzer and Andrew Cuomo. Uh, welcome, Athene. And finally, uh, Patty Zettler. Uh, she was just promoted to associate professor of law here at Moritz and joined us. She's just completing her first year here at the law school. She's a faculty member of the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center housed at the law school and is a member of the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. Professor Zettler's research focuses on the regulation of medicine, drugs, and other medical products and tobacco products with an emphasis on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Her scholarship has been featured in leading legal, interdisciplinary, and medical journals, including science. Uh, so with those introductions uh, out of the way, let me begin the conversation, if I might. Uh, we'll start with Professor Berman. Uh, to get us started, uh, Micah, can you tell us what are our, what we are currently seeing in the courts pertaining to COVID-19 in terms of addressing social distancing and other ways we're combating this pandemic? Sure, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. It's great to be a, a part of this conversation, um, even though it's, it's obviously a, a troubling time um, in general and, and in particular with coronavirus cases now trending upward again. Uh, nationally. Uh, in, in terms of litigation, uh, it's, it's too early to say uh, what the, the takeaway lessons will be from all the litigation that's happening right now, but, but we know that there is a lot of litigation happening right now that is certainly going to reshape the field of public health law and probably a lot of other uh, legal fields as well uh, over the coming years and even, even decades. Uh, 
Um, we now have more than 200 cases that have been filed around the country and in state courts and in federal courts addressing various aspects of COVID-19 restrictions. And then there's another 100 cases on top of that uh, just dealing with issues surrounding elections and voting. So I'm not going to get into that category of cases. But if you look at, at the ones talking about stay-at-home orders and, and social distancing uh, measures, uh, those cases kind of fall into two broad categories. The first category would be constitutional claims, constitutional litigation, um, all sorts of constitutional claims, First Amendment claims about uh, religious freedom. There are claims about um, abortion access, travel restrictions, equal protection claims, all, I mean, pretty much all those different parts of the Constitution, we've, we've, we've seen lots of, uh, of different types of those uh, lawsuits. And you know, I've always taught my students that in times of public health crises, courts tend to be deferential to public officials, especially in cases uh, like this, where public officials have to make very difficult calls balancing multiple factors in, in the context of, of incomplete information. And, and I think that's mostly been true in terms of what we've seen as, as the result of these cases so far. So your, your constitutional rights don't go away in a pandemic, but, but neither are your constitutional rights absolute. And you know, that is especially true when, when public health is at stake. So just to, to mention one case quickly, the, the only case that, that has really given the Supreme Court the opportunity to weigh in is South Bay United Pentecostal Church versus Newsom, uh, which was a challenge uh, to uh, the California governor's order uh, restricting attendance at, at churches and other places of worship. And you know, it was technically not uh, a ruling on the merits, but the Supreme Court um, declined to, to enjoin that order. And in doing so, um, Chief Justice Roberts writing for the majority said, decisions like this should be left to the appropriate public officials. Uh, and then he also said that the order appeared to be consistent with the First Amendment. And I think that's generally in line with the kind of deference to public officials that, that you usually see in these types of emergency situations. Uh, but, and, and it's a big but, uh, it was a five to four decision from the Supreme Court. There was a pretty vigorous dissent um, from Justice Kavanaugh joined by Justices uh, Gorsuch and Thomas, uh, saying that there was a, you know, in their view, a likely First Amendment violation here that, that did need to be investigated. Uh, and then Justice Alito also dissented, but, but did not write a separate opinion uh, explaining his reasoning. So that, that's the constitutional category. The other category of cases has been lawsuits challenging state level emergency orders uh, on either statutory grounds or separation of powers grounds. Uh, so claims that you know, either the governor or the health director was uh, exceeding his or her statutory authority or that that whole statutory framework was uh, invalid for some reason. And plaintiffs have lost most of these lawsuits too, uh, but some courts have struck down uh, emergency orders on, on these types of, of grounds. The most notable case was in Wisconsin. Uh, which was Wisconsin legislature versus Palm, where a very divided Supreme Court voided the, the state's stay-at-home order. And there have been similar decisions in, in other state lower courts as well, including two decisions uh, here in Ohio that are, are likely to be appealed. Uh, and there, there's certainly politics uh, involved in these cases, which you get from the name. Wisconsin legislature versus Palm was the Republican legislature uh, versus the uh, health director who was appointed by, by a Democrat. Um, but to, to get to the, the legal issue, I think it's also true that uh, the law regarding social distancing measures is just in many states grossly underdeveloped um, and, and often unclear. And that, that's because uh, social distancing measures are, are really a, a public health measure of last resort and they are one that we have not had to use on a broad basis in this country in, in literally 100 years. Uh, so the law in many places is not developed um, in, in detail. In Ohio, most of the relevant law was written in the 1950s and hasn't really been, been looked at or updated uh, since then. So you know, we'll, we'll see 
um, you know, what, what the impact of these court decisions is in the, the short term. But I think, you know, going forward, I, I would really expect to see many states uh, rethinking the, the legislative framework that they have in place for, for public health emergencies in general and for, for social distancing orders in particular. Great, incredibly helpful. Um, and just as a reminder to the audience, if you have questions, please do use the Q&A box uh, to pose them. I'm happy to serve as the moderator and to uh, ask those of our panelists as we move through the discussion. Uh, as a follow-up, Professor Berman, can you talk a little bit about the tensions between the different levels of government involved here in terms of the crisis, um, federal versus state and local, and what that looks like? Obviously, an issue that plays uh, a large role in our society as a federalist uh, nation. Uh, how is that working here? Sure. So public health traditionally has been a state and local uh, function, of, at least as an initial matter. And, and in public health emergencies, the federal government's role is usually to provide resources and, and critically to provide uh, information and guidance and, and expertise, but then leave the decision making to governments at, at the state and local level. Uh, with the, the stay-at-home stay orders that we've had, and one a major purpose of those was essentially to buy time uh, so that states would have the capacity to uh, set up testing and, and tracing and um, isolation and quarantine measures for, for uh, confirmed cases and contacts so that we could then, you know, quote unquote, reopen um, much more safely. Uh, the, the problem is essentially that the federal government support for doing that just, just never arrived. Uh, and so state and governments have been left on their own um, without the resources that they need, without the guidance that they need. Uh, and in some cases, that's led to states essentially being pit against one another. Now we're seeing some states imposing travel restrictions against other states and, and um, you know, unfortunate outcomes like that. At the, the state level, the tension between state governments and local governments, particularly in states where you have uh, Republican legislatures and kind of democratically controlled cities, uh, has been a major issue and point of friction in, in public health law uh, for years on all sorts of topics. And, and you've certainly seen that here as well. A number of states, Florida, Georgia, Texas, Tennessee, um, have you know, the, at the state level uh, imposed orders that, that restrict what local governments can do uh, to respond locally to the coronavirus outbreaks. Uh, and I think that's, that's troubling for public health, but it's also, I think, really confusing uh, for people um, trying to decide uh, how to respond to see different messages, and this is you know, all the way up from local to state to federal, to see different types of messages coming from public officials at, at different levels is usually what you try to avoid uh, in, in public health crises. Um, and it, it goes against everything that we, we know is effective in terms of public health communication. Uh, so that's been you know, a, a major um, challenge and impediment to, to an effective response, I think. All right, thank you, very helpful. So with that uh, framework sort of set in terms of what some of the litigation looks like and what the different uh, governmental structures are and how they're playing into the crisis. Maybe let's turn to talking about risks for a moment. Um, Professor Parasitis, in thinking about public health risks, um, how can and do policymakers um, balance some of the risks we're seeing from the COVID pandemic? Obviously, the health risks uh, are, are clear, um, but there are also broader socioeconomic risks, including loss of jobs, mental health, um, and the impacts on the economy. Thank you, Dean Davies, and, and thanks to everyone who was able to, to join today. We're really looking forward to, to your questions. Um, if you think back, it's been about three months uh, since, since this country largely has been on lockdown. Um, and initially, the calculus, the risk calculus, focused primarily on the health risk from contracting um, COVID-19. And along with that was, what would the impact be on the healthcare infrastructure? There were so many unknowns about how the virus was transmitted. Um, how contagious it was, et cetera. And the calculus at the time in you know, mid-March throughout this country was essentially stop everything. Um, we need to worry about the health risks and focus on them first. But of course, as we know, um, and it wasn't unpredictable at the time, that resulted in a battered economy, 
um, significant reduction in, let's say, educational experiences across colleges, grade schools, um, big backdrop in um, the court system, in workplaces, and a massive toll on mental health. I'm sure there's not one person who, at least to a certain extent, was impacted um, in terms of increased anxiety or depression um, from what was going on in the world. Um, more recently, the shift has been, okay, we know more about COVID now. We know better how it's transmitted. We have a sense that our healthcare system can handle the serious cases um, in the hospital system. How can we start to readjust the risk calculus and perhaps start to reopen the economy? Um, of course, as we're doing so, we're trying to be mindful of what measures are necessary to make reopening safe, or at least safe enough, that we feel comfortable taking on those risks that come, um, that still come from COVID. And like we're, as Professor Berman mentioned, as we're seeing across the country, um, you know, we have the 50 laboratories of democracy through the states, and we're seeing different states take different, um, you know, some take more aggressive reopening measures, others are a little bit more measured. And we're noticing, um, you know, upticks in places where perhaps the measures are not as strong or where the lifting of the public health measures happen perhaps too quickly. So all this is to say that um, there is no risk-free world when it comes to protecting our health, when it comes to protecting um, the economy, when it comes to protecting um, sort of our mental well-being. And one thing that the law is trying to do in all of this is, is trying to balance all the social factors as well. So, um, you know, nobody has the perfect answer. And I think as we're seeing as we march forward into the fall and, you know, perhaps more importantly into the winter, um, this is going to be a very fluid system where um, there's going to be a lot more trial and error. So as we as we think about that and the reopening of the economies, which we've you know already started to see, and then obviously uh, as you just described, a relationship between uh, some of the rising of the, of the cases and uh, some back and forth in terms of what that reopening looks like. Um, what challenges does that raise for businesses, in particular, employers, uh, employees, and consumers? And I know we do have one question in the Q and A. I encourage folks to continue to send those questions in about. Uh, people who, you know, for instance, uh, were pushed out of a condo or an apartment uh, because those buildings were closed down uh, and, you know, maybe a lack of the force majeure provision in uh, their lease agreements. Yeah, these, it's a great question. Um, on the employer-employee side, right, we're going to see what we're seeing essentially is employers um, really pushing to reopen their businesses. Um, trying to make uh, a safe environment, working environment for their employees, a safe environment for consumers to come in, um, and again, in a goal to reinvigorate um, the economy. Of course, what we're seeing as well is that folks have different ideas of what's necessary, right? Whether it comes to wearing a mask or how close you can come to someone in contact in terms of physical distancing. There are many people who simply just don't believe that masks actually work or that they're necessary. And it's hard, um, at least from an employee perspective, to feel that, that you have some type of control over what's happening around you. Um, and employers are necessarily worried and under, employees are understandably worried. And a lot of employers, as we've seen, are looking to have their employees sign waivers that say basically that if they contract um, coronavirus while on the job, that the employer isn't gonna be held responsible. We've seen a lot of discussion in Congress about implementing some liability shields for employers as well. Um, of course, as we all remember from torts class, you know, to what extent will a waiver of actually be enforceable by a court, especially one that seeks to waive negligence? Um, another problem is sort of the ethics of it all, right? To what extent is requiring your employees to sign a waiver um, something that might lead to subpar safety measures that are put in place by the employer for their employees or, or for the consumers? So again, there's a lot of, I think, really interesting and important legal um, questions here about who should bear the burden of the risk, right? Should it be the employers bearing the burden of the risk? Should it be the employees? Should it be the consumer? Um, are liability shields something that's worthwhile perhaps to, you know, to limit what some may find to be frivolous lawsuits? At the same time, is that limiting of lawsuits gonna capture legitimate lawsuits or maybe an employer didn't take adequate measures to um, provide safety for their employees and their consumers. And I think, you know, we've already seen a wave of lawsuits um, from employees who've contracted coronavirus while on the job. I wouldn't be surprised to start seeing those from students, from consumers, 
um, grow in the, in the coming months. So another uh, question from the audience. Um, I know, obviously, you're an expert in, in bioethics, Athemi. Uh, thoughts about what that might look like in terms of ethics or responsibilities for employers who begin to look for um, waivers from their employees uh, in terms of liability as they come back to work. I saw it yesterday Disneyland had announced um, it's going to delay its reopening, and there are labor issues involved there as well. Personally, I don't think that it is ethical to ask for a waiver from, from an employee. I think that employers should do what they can to assure their workers that they're doing, taking reasonable measures to provide a safe working environment and be clear that um, it's impossible to have a risk-free environment, right? Even in a case that's brought where a person may contract coronavirus on the job, right? If that case were, go to, were to go to court, the question is, not you know, did the employer take every possible measure to protect their employees is that they take reasonable measures to protect their employees. So, so again, I think the answer comes down to our employers acting reasonably, our employees aware of the risks, right, that they may have from going to the job or even going to the supermarket. Um, and how do we as a society balance all those, right? Coronavirus isn't the first virus that's contagious or that's deadly. Um, there are many more. And, and again, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, managing the risk is different than preventing it. And it's not fair to ask anyone to try to prevent risk um, at all costs. Yeah, so maybe, uh, go ahead, Professor. Oh, I was just gonna add to sort of elaborate on something Asimi said, which is even thinking about it from a sort of public health policy perspective and against the background of differing messages and different approaches from local, state, and federal governments that Micah mentioned, um, you know, we might think about liability as a tool for um, driving good public health practices. Um, as Athemi mentioned, we're not talking about um, uh, businesses and employers having to do everything possible to prevent infection, but instead take reasonable measures. And we might think about that as a, if we think tort law can play a role in um, uh, driving sort of good policy decisions across the board, that might be one tool to help against that background of confusing messaging um, from government officials that, that Micah was talking about. Yeah, I, one other, um, you know, a, a little bit of a tangent, but, but on the topic of, of employees, which I, I think is just a critical topic to be thinking about. I mean, to me, a major a theme of these last few months uh, has been that you know, when, when you um, take efforts to make it harder for, for government to work, then, then government doesn't work um, when, when you need it to. And we've seen, oh, I apologize. Um, we, we've seen that in our um, uh, public health departments, which have been slashed in, in recent years. And that's me, I apologize. Um, one second. Nobody ever calls a landline anymore except when you don't want them to. Um, you know, you've seen that in health departments, uh, which have had their budgets absolutely slashed in the last decade, and then you know, for people to be called upon to do testing and tracing after that is, is just impossible. Um, but an, another example of that is, is OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which, um, this is true, uh, they have received more than 5,000 complaints over the last couple months, and they've issued exactly one citation. Um, so it's just a, you know, a clear example of an agency that is, is set up to you know, be there as a support in, in instances just like this that is just you know, absolutely missing in action. And, and we've seen some efforts in the states. Uh, Virginia was actually moving forward just yesterday on this topic uh, of state level labor departments trying to step in. Um, but, but that's been a major gap. And I see another question sort of about uh, leasing. Maybe we'll come back to that toward the end of the conversation if time permits. Um, in the meantime, there's another question from an audience member about uh, public gatherings, particularly um, religious services and peaceful protests. Um, a, a question for the panel, really. Uh, should the same kind of health protections be applied to those types of gatherings um, as are being applied in you know, smaller spaces like offices? I, I guess I can take a shot at that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to answer in, in broad terms when you're talking about different, different situations and different circumstances and, and different um, points in time. Um, 
and you know, I, I think as as Professor Parasiti said, it's it's a question of um, balancing different concerns and and managing the risks. Um, so you know, thinking in terms of um, of well, I mean, there, there's different values in, at, at play. Um, you know, when you're thinking about um, protests and protecting First Amendment protections, and that that's obviously incredibly important. Um, you know, I think even when people are not complying um, with with um, you know, legal restrictions, we need to be thinking carefully about what the appropriate um, response is. Um, you know, especially in a, situations where you know, actually um, locking people up is a really good way for for supercharging the spread of um, of COVID nineteen. So, you know, I think we need to be um, you know thinking about the role that government can play in, in all of these settings in terms of. Um, reducing risk and playing a, a helpful role in, in St. Louis. I saw that when people, you know, at, at protests, there were government officials out there, government officials out there, you know, distributing masks, trying to make it a safer uh, environment. I, I think that's a very, very positive model to, to be thinking about. Other thoughts, Professor Zettler, Parasitas? Um, I mean, I think that question also goes to what uh, Professor Berman was saying earlier about uh, our constitutional rights not being absolute. And so, you know, there'll be some sort of balancing of uh, constitutional rights and the, the public health needs that uh, we we're already seeing in the litigation Professor Berman was talking about. The only other point I'll add is, you know, the public health person in me will say, well, it's never a good thing to not wear a mask and to not maintain physical distancing. And, and there should be as few exceptions as possible. And really what's the difference between a protest and going to church? And I think those are legitimate questions that, that people are raising. Um, and again, I think, you know, the, anytime you have a paternalistic public health policy, right, that tells someone to do something that they don't necessarily want to do, um, the question of enforcement is one that, you know, flows down the river of public health ethics, right? Is it gonna serve the public trust to, you know, slap people on the risk, arrest them, fine them, when they're not complying with a measure that's meant to promote their health and that of the community? Or is it better to take um, a different approach, which is um, like Professor Zettler and Berman mentioned, you know, hand out masks, give people reminders about how it's still contagious and, and lethal the virus can be and encourage them to really take seriously what these measures are. So just a, a quick follow-up on this a question from the audience. Uh, if locking people up contributes to the spread, which we know is the case, we've seen a lot of the numbers from many states, uh, heavy numbers of uh, people who are imprisoned uh, in terms of infection rates, should we cancel peaceful protests uh, in the interest of protecting people, becoming aggressive, or take some other kind of proactive measure? You mentioned masks, or there other things that can be done to protect people who might want to protest? Not easy questions from the, from the audience. I'll take a first tab. Um, you know, it, it doesn't seem realistic to, to go to a protest and say, you know, here's a six foot long pole. There needs to be this much space between every person, um, even though that's what public health officials might want. At the same time, you know, I think you have to look at what the transmission risk is in different places, right? So outside the risk is smaller than it might be in an elevator or in an office building. So, so there, there, you know, there, and if you look at the data, there are studies that show that some, in some instances, one, you know, one meter or three feet might be enough in an outdoor space that's well ventilated to, to stop the spread. So I think that's where, you know, officials like to give hard numbers, six feet, always wear a mask. Um, but the data is shakier, right? In some instances, 10 feet might not be enough. So again, I, I think there's no hard and fast answer to say, you know, ban the protesters or don't allow them to be anywhere closer than six feet to each other. Um, and it'll be interesting to see to what extent researchers can actually, you know, pinpoint cities where there were protests and match them with upticks in cases. I haven't seen any of that yet. Yeah, and I, th I think we'll get into this in a minute, but I mean, the, you know, racism is a, a very significant public health threat as, as well. And, you know, I think these protests have actually sparked um, some very productive um, conversation about that, that, you know, the, the public health impact even of, of these types of protests um, could be quite significant over the long term. So I think that that is a consideration as well. 
Great. Uh, so let's let's turn to you, Professor Zettler. I have a question uh, thinking about what the future of the pandemic might look like and understanding that there are, you know, there's a lot going on in terms of medical devices, regulation, um, tests being uh, assessed, used, new testing methods coming out, um, and a lot of discussion about the possibility of vaccine and particularly um, a vaccine that's really sped up in terms of this usual approval process. Can you talk to us about what that might look like, what the FDA's involvement is, um, and sort of what their prospects are going forward. Sure, thanks, yeah, great, great question, and thank you. Uh, I guess I, I haven't had the chance to do my thank you, but thank you, uh, Dean Davies, for, for moderating, and um, I'm really, I wish we could all be together in person, but I'm delighted to be talking about these important issues with, um, with everyone. Um, so, um, I think in a lot of ways, what we've seen with medical product development for COVID-19 is, is really pretty inspiring. There have been tremendous efforts to innovate and develop products on accelerated timelines, as Dean Davies mentioned. Um, and some of those efforts are happening right here at Ohio State. Um, I think, uh, for example, there's research on developing a breathalyzer test for COVID-19 because some of the nose swab tests are relatively uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, that's, that's exciting. Um, but in terms of FDA's role, we typically think of our drugs, our vaccines, our devices, things like diagnostic or antibody tests as FDA approved or authorized as safe and effective. And to show that a product is safe and effective, manufacturers generally have to generate a significant amount of information, starting with preclinical testing, if we're talking about drugs or vaccines, um, in labs or animals, and then moving to um, clinical trials in humans. And this is a long and time-consuming and expensive process. And uh, we require this extensive process and government permission to market medical products on the theory that this will protect us as patients, sort of physically protect us from unsafe and ineffective products, um, but also on the theory that we need this sort of government gatekeeping role to really incentivize the production of information about medical products that healthcare professionals and patients need. So um, to paraphrase a former FDA commissioner, uh, Dr. Margaret Hamburg, it's not innovation if it doesn't work, right? We want things to work. We don't just want new products for products sake, we want products that work. Um, so this all takes a long time. Um, and so they're, you know, in uh, recognition of the, t uh, the sort of time consuming process that we have, there is a special mechanism available to FDA and manufacturers in times of public health emergency, um, like right now, uh, known as an emergency use authorization or an EUA. So FDA can issue an EUA to permit the distribution of a product, whether we're talking about a drug, a vaccine, or something like a test, um, if various criteria are met, including that it's reasonable to believe the product may be effective. So note this is a distinctly lower standard than um, sort of the safe and effective standard we think of for FDA approval. And so I think one sort of baseline thing to understand is we've had this sort of inspiring um, push to accelerate development of products, but we're still really pretty far back in the process. There are no FDA approved products for COVID-19 right now. All of the products that are out there have been issued these EUAs on the idea that it's sort of, it's reasonable to believe they may be effective, but we don't yet know that they are. Um, and, you know, I think it's also important to recognize that right now in a global public health emergency like the pandemic we're in, um, FDA is faced with a task that is even more difficult than usual. We really need to develop rigorous evidence of safety and effectiveness. We really need to know what works for COVID-19 and what doesn't. On the other hand, there's this urgent need to move quickly, right? Everyone is very invested in having access to tests, drugs, vaccines that work. Um, and arguably that Congress added this authority to issue EUAs to FDA's statutory authority suggests that we've made sort of a social decision that the standards should be flexible or, you know, there should be the flexibility to lower standards um, in times of public health emergency. Um, and FDA is likely, and all regulators around the globe are likely to face tremendous political pressure um, to exercise such flexibility, whether from other, um, whether from politicians or industry or patients or other stakeholders. And there's a real need for regulators to be responsive to patients' concerns. So, um, you know, all of that is to say that, uh, you know, I think 
sort of important takeaways are, you know, there's a lot of great work going on um, right now. Nothing is proven effective for um, for uh, COVID-19. We're still early in that sense. Nothing's FDA approved as we normally think of it. Um, and when it comes to vaccines, um, you know, I think if, if a vaccine is issued in EUA, we should be aware that that's, that, that is not the same as an FDA approval. And I think we should probably all, uh, all hope for, for evidence supporting a vaccine that is sufficient for approval before the vaccine is actually distributed. But um, I, uh, in terms of discussing vaccines, I wanna turn the floor over to <laughs> Professor Parasitis, who is our, uh, I think, probably most expert in, in sort of the intricacies of vaccine regulation and law. Thanks, Patty. And I'll, and I'll note, um, we're lucky to have Professor Zettler. She, she worked in-house at the FDA for several years, so she truly is the expert. Um, I just play one on, on Zoom. Um, in terms of vaccines, the quickest vaccine to ever come to market from a swab to the public was four years, and that was the mumps vaccine in the 1960s. Most vaccines take a decade or longer from the time of initial research and development towards something that's proven to be um, safe and effective. And of course, any proven vaccine um, still has risks, right? So every vaccine, however small the risks may be, the risks are real. Um, in that context, an EUA for a vaccine, um, at least as far as pub that's publicly available, the only time the FDA has ever issued one was with the anthrax vaccine in um, a 2004, 2005 time period. And that vaccine was already approved for um, one indication and the Department of Defense wanted to get approved for a second indication. So without going into the details there, um, that's the only time uh, a vaccine has ever earned um, market authorization through, through an EUA. And it's for all the reasons that Professor Zettler mentioned, which is the fact that EUAs really do have a very low bar for um, the amount of evidence that's necessary. The other side is that when it comes to if, let's say if the FDA issues an EUA for a COVID vaccine, um, that vaccine could not be mandated. So the EUA protocol itself says that at least for civilians, an EUA issued vaccine can't be part of a mandatory vaccination program, it has to be optional. Um, in the armed forces, it's different. So an EUA vaccine can be mandated for members of, the, members of the armed forces. So for that to be a mandatory vaccine, it would have to go through the traditional FDA approval process um, showing efficacy, safety, immunogenicity, and all these other things. And there's an, and one last thing I'll mention is that, you know, there's an important um, kind of lesson to be learned from the last time there was a public health crisis in a vaccine that was rushed to market. And that was in 1976 with swine flu. And there, um, the vaccine itself ended up causing more serious adverse events and deaths than the virus. Um, and it was something that, you know, it was a while ago, so most people don't recognize that it happened or realize it, but it's just another warning when it comes at least to vaccines, right? Vaccines are not like therapies where an EUA for a drug is gonna be given to someone who's sick, it's kind of the last chance for them to get better, but a vaccine is given to a healthy person um, who doesn't necessarily have the disease and therefore um, isn't as in an urgent position as a person might be who um, is in a hospital bed. So I'll stop there. Great. So there's a couple of follow-up questions about uh, vaccines. Um, one is, do we expect that when a, a vaccine comes to market in the U.S., it's going to have an EUA or some other kind of provisional approval from the FDA, or do we think it will have to end up going through that full-fledged approval? And then likewise, in terms of um, a foreign vaccine, if the U.K. approves a vaccine, is there anything in place here in the U.S. to stop use of that vaccine? Um, or would have to go through its own approval process here in the U.S.? Um, I could start. So um, nothing in the law prevents FDA from issuing an EUA for a vaccine. But, um, and so it could, it could happen. Um, and, but I think as Professor Parasitis was explaining, um, you know, it, it isn't, it's rare. It's only happened once before that FDA has issued uh, an EUA. Um, I personally hope it does not happen. Um, I don't think, um, you know, for all of the reasons we've been talking about, vaccines are different. They're uh, interventions intended for healthy people, not 
interventions intended for sick people without other options. And, um, you know, there's already sort of a background of vaccine hesitancy. And, uh, you know, against that background, I think it, it, among many other reasons, it's quite troubling to think about a vaccine being widely distributed based on very limited evidence of safety and effectiveness, uh, much more limited than we'd normally expect. Um, but you know the law. The law permits it. The law permits FDA to issue an EUA uh, for a vaccine. Um, in terms of vaccine, if vaccine were approved in another country first before here in the U.S. Um, under uh, under federal law, it's not. There's no sort of reciprocity. It's not as though if a vaccine is approved um, in the EU, it's sort of automatically approved here. Uh, companies are still required to go through the sort of FDA approval process for products approved elsewhere. Um, but often they can rely on data uh, that they relied on for the um, foreign regulators. And you know, you could imagine maybe that would be an appropriate circumstance for FDA to issue an EUA while the approval uh, process was ongoing. If there were sort of already sufficient data, um, you know, we already had sort of a good um, uh, a lot of data about the vaccine from, from a foreign regulator's approval. Um, but there's no sort of automatic reciprocity. Okay, one other uh, quick follow-up from the audience. In terms of other drugs, not a vaccine per se, but um, drugs that might be used, I think the, the term is off-label, uh, they're normally used for something else, but they could have an impact here or help with the coronavirus. Um, what does that look like, and are, is there, are there mechanisms in place legally to stop that in the U.S.? Um, so uh, I think sort of buried in this question, or, or part of this question, is when FDA approves a drug, for example, it's approving the drug for a specific use. So a drug's not approved as safe and effective overall. It's safe and effective for the particular use for which it was studied. Um, and generally, healthcare professionals can prescribe it for any use once it's approved for one use. So um, the uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, the malaria drugs that, well, drugs approved for malaria and lupus and uh, I believe rheumatoid arthritis uh, were, um, uh, they're on the market and they've been talked about as potential COVID-19 vaccines. And I won't go into the details, but FDA did issue an EUA for them for COVID-19 and with those EUAs have now been revoked. Um, but there are mechanisms for FDA to limit off-label prescribing. There, when drugs are approved, FDA can require certain risk mitigation strategies that can have the effect of limiting off-label prescribing, for example, limiting the dispensing of the drugs for only when certain documentation is present um, or limiting the settings in which the drugs can be dispensed, say only in hospitals or something like that. Um, states can also use their authority to regulate the practice of medicine to limit off-label prescribing. So with um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, we've, we've seen state um, boards of medicine and boards of pharmacy limit off-label prescribing for COVID-19 because of concerns about um, shortages for patients for whom the drugs are approved. So there are mechanisms to limit off-label prescribing um, that both, both at the federal and the, and the state level. Okay, let's, uh, let's turn to another topic. Uh, Professor Berman, you previously mentioned the question of, of race and racial disparities, and obviously we've seen uh, in the data and the news media a lot of discussion about disparities of the way uh, the, the coronavirus is impacting society. Many of those are along race. Um, why are we seeing that, and what types of, uh, of disparities are we seeing, and what responses are we seeing from policy and lawmakers? Well, in terms of why we're seeing this, uh, I, I mean, I think it's just a reflection of the, the massive health disparities um, that, that we always have in this country um, by race, by income, by geography, by, by all sorts of, of different socioeconomic dimensions. And, and they're there all the time, but, but we tend to ignore them. Um, this has been an example where, where it's uh, providing a much more vivid picture of it. I, I mean, in Ohio, um, there is a 30 year difference in life expectancy just within Ohio between the you know, quote unquote healthiest zip code and the, the least healthy zip code, which is just, um, it's just stunning. Um, but you know, as I mentioned, I think we're, we're hopefully now starting to pay more attention um, to these issues. And, and I'm hopeful that the, the you know, emerging discussion of, of racism as a, a public health issue will contribute to that. 
uh, for for people who are interested in this issue, particularly with respect to um, to COVID nineteen, uh, I would encourage you to read a piece that was just published in the Journal of Law and the Biosciences. It's a it's a pretty short piece uh, by Professor Sima Moapatra and Rikaya Yerbi um, called "Law, Structural Racism, and the COVID nineteen Pandemic." Um, it's it's freely available if you just um, search for it online, and and they really walk through how there are um, three different factors at work um, that are, are contributing to these disparities. Uh, and the first is that the racial and eth ethnic minorities um, face increased risk of exposure uh, because they disproportionately work in, in low-income jobs uh, and can't um, work from home and um, take uh, you know, other measures to um, avoid exposure. Uh, secondly, they uh, have increased susceptibility because of, of pre-existing um, health conditions, which are, are largely the result of uh, residential segregation, disinvestment in, in particular communities, uh, and so forth. And then third, they, they also lack equitable access to appropriate testing and treatment. Um, and, and you put all those things together, you're, you're seeing, seeing the result um, that we see now. And, and these two authors very clearly explain uh, how all of those factors can be tied back to historical and current uh, laws and, and policies and practices which, which have created and reinforced uh, the, the structural racism that, that permeates our lives. So, um, so that's, I think, why we're seeing it in terms of what to do. Uh, there's, there's obviously no easy fix there. Um, one, I mean, I think the easiest thing you would think uh, would be to to at least be collecting good data on um, on the disparities that we're seeing. And actually, at the, at the beginning of this outbreak, at least, was incredibly difficult to even get um, information on on cases and hospitalizations and deaths by by race and socioeconomic status. And and still, we're um, it's getting better in some places, but it's still very choppy um, state by state. Uh, that that should be the clear easy thing that, that should have been done a long time ago. Um, but second, I, I mean, I think we're, we're going to have to, um, you know, reflect on the response to, uh, to this pandemic and, and think about all the ways that um, you know, the way that we as a society responded, um, you know, I think had the result of allowing those who are already privileged to protect themselves um, at the expense of, of those that we have, um, referred to as essential workers in many cases, but not necessarily treated as such. An audience follow up on uh, disparities. There's also some, been some indication that there's disparity in the impact of the disease uh, on male versus female, um, people who've been uh, afflicted with it. Is there something the uh, public health system should be doing to respond to that, or what does that look like overall? I, I don't have a great answer to that question. I mean, I think part of that is is just going back to the epidemiology and, and so much that we still don't know about about this disease and, and how it spreads, but I don't know if, if others have more specific thoughts. Okay. Uh, let me turn, I think there's uh, one other question. This one may be for you, Professor Zettler. A question uh, from the audience about whether there's been an increase in FDA activity in terms of enforcement regarding promotion of uh, either prescription or non-prescription drugs. Um, the audience member refers to them as snake oil. Uh, so I think we know what we're getting at here in terms of dealing with uh, people who've uh, uh, been infected with the disease. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, yes, the short answer is yes. So FDA and the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, announced that um, what the agencies call health fraud products for COVID-19 are, are an enforcement priority, and I think um, rightly so. I think just sort of as um, sort of the, in, in terms of the market of health products, whether we're talking about uh, prescription drugs or stem cell interventions or diagnostic tests or antibody tests or um, I saw that there were some warning letters, I think a couple of days ago to um, companies selling CBD for COVID-19. 
Um, so whenever we have something like COVID-19, this tends to happen, say, every flu season, for example, you tend to see online retailers selling products that are not supported by evidence um, for those, um, uh, for, you know, whatever is the, the ailment of the day. So, you know, absolutely, I think it's sort of a, you know, consumers need to know that, that things get sold. FDA and FTC are prioritizing enforcement against companies selling health fraud products. Uh, you know, there's no way to achieve 100% compliance. So that those products will still be out there no matter how much, uh, how much enforcement we see, but it is definitely um, a, a publicly announced priority on behalf of the agencies. Great. Uh, another question from the audience, this one I think for Professor Berman. Uh, do you anticipate there will be any impact or fallout in terms of what the coronavirus does uh, with respect to tobacco regulation, and in particular, perhaps increased restrictions on public use of tobacco products? Um, I, would, I would like to think so, but I sort of doubt it. Um, I mean, I, the you know the way that we tend to think about public health issues is we put a spotlight on one issue at a time and um, certainly COVID-19 is going to be in that spotlight um, for the foreseeable future uh, and, and probably crowd out um, progress on, on some other public health issues. Um, I will say though I, I, there has been um, increased attention within health systems um, of the interaction between um, smoking and, and COVID-19 and it, it likely does contribute to a, a worsening of symptoms and worsening of health outcomes. And I mean, it's been a challenge for, uh, for a long time to get um, health systems to, um, to just sort of put the mechanisms in place to connect people when they come into the hospital uh, with resources and support uh, to quit smoking. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, you know, one result, a uh, positive result that we might come out with is, is hospitals uh, really solidifying those systems and having that better in place to, to provide support to people when they when they do come into the hospital for whatever reason. Terrific. So circling back to one of the conversations we were having earlier about employer and employee relations, obviously there's been um, a lot in the media about uh, outbreaks in meatpacking and in poultry facilities. Have, has there been any legal action to date uh, with respect to exposure in those facilities or other places where there have been uh, large outbreaks uh, with employers? I, I, I don't know the details. I think that um, some companies have been sued. Um, I'm not sure if Smithfield, the one food company or some of the other plants have actually been sued specifically. I wouldn't be surprised if they, if they do get sued. Um, you know, part of the challenge in those, those factories is that people are so close together. I mean, it's a little disgusting, actually, when you look at the video of how close together folks are, you know, chopping up chickens and things like that. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised. Again, the question will become, you know, did, did the employer take reasonable measures to protect their employees? Um, you know, there have been cases against Amazon, uh, I know, and probably some other companies I can't think of right now. If the question's getting at legal action with respect to sort of government rather than, you know, private entities suing each other under sort of tort law. I, I'm not aware of any, but Professor Berman and uh, Professor Parasitis may know if states have done anything specific to uh, meatpacking facilities. I mean, it's, it's largely what I was referencing before. I mean, th those are cases where you would think that, you know, would be the appropriate place for, for OSHA to step in and, and think about um, you know, what, what are the ways to make this safer for the employees? And, and the, the result has been, um, you know, almost precisely the opposite. It's been more pressure to, to keep those, those plants going uh, in order to keep meat production going uh, with, I think, fairly little regard for, for the workers that are actually there. All right, and with that, uh, let me just take a moment to thank uh, each of you, Professor Zettler, Professor Parasitas, Professor Berman, um, for lending your voices and expertise on these issues. Incredibly illuminating uh, and timely. Um, I know there are a lot of challenges that we're facing with this pandemic, and so really uh, useful to explore this uh, from a legal perspective. I also want to thank everyone who's tuned in. I hope uh, you really enjoyed this inaugural event. I'd encourage you to continue to in, tuning in to this new series. Uh, we're very excited about it, and next month, on July 28th from 3 o'clock until 4.30 p.m. Uh, our next installment of discussions from Drinko Hall will cover the Supreme Court as a year in review.
Uh, we're going to have an exceptional panel to present on six key cases from this past year uh, and to talk about what the court has done over the last term. So please watch your inbox for an invitation for that in the coming weeks. Thank you for your time and your uh, participation. We hope that you found today both enlightening and engaging. Um, be well and go Bucks.